In a previous video, we discovered two magical properties of eigenvalues. And the first one is that their sum equals the trace of the matrix. That's the sum of its diagonal entries. And their product is the determinant of the matrix. Now, why do I call these properties magical? Well, it's simply because it's hard to believe that something like that could be true. Eigenvalues are a very sophisticated concept, and the algorithm for determining the eigenvalues has a number of steps, and it's not at all a simple algorithm. There is great complexity involved, and it's not at all clear how eigenvalues depend on the entries of the matrix. That dependence is very complicated. In fact, sometimes it's quite chaotic, meaning that changing one of the entries just a little bit can have a dramatic effect on the eigenvalues. In fact, it can change the structure of the spectrum completely. So given all that complexity, it's very hard to believe that those properties can be true for all matrices, that the sum of the eigenvalues is the trace and the product is the determinant. Those properties are just amazing. They really are. So in this video, I'm hoping to give you a pretty good reason for why that is true. And our argument won't cover all possible cases. We'll exclude the case of complex eigenvalues, which is uh, something that we won't consider until much further down the road in this course. And we'll also exclude the so-called defective case. We haven't talked about defective matrices yet, but we will shortly. But this argument works in all other cases, so it's quite general, and it's certainly quite satisfactory for our intents and purposes. And that is just to see how something like that, something so amazing, can be true on such a consistent basis. So let's review the eigenvalue algorithm. And that's to subtract lambda from the diagonal. So here we have the diagonal entries with lambda subtracted out. And of course, the matrix is full of other entries that we won't pay that much attention to in this discussion. And in the language of matrix algebra, it's A minus lambda I. That's subtracting lambda from the diagonal in the language of matrix algebra. And then we have to evaluate the determinant, and that will give us the characteristic polynomial. Not right away. Of course, the full expansion includes n factorial terms, so there's a great number of terms. But a lot of them will combine and will be left with this characteristic polynomial. And of course, once again, the coefficients of this polynomial depend on the entries of the matrix in a very complicated way. But we can focus on three of the coefficients. Of all the coefficients in this polynomial, three are the most important. We can say similar things about other coefficients, but it just won't be as stark and as beautiful. So those coefficients are the leading one, the next one, the one corresponding to lambda to the n minus one, and the free coefficient, which we can denote by c at this point. So let's determine what those coefficients are. So other coefficients are more difficult to determine in terms of the entries of the matrix, but these three are easy. So let's start with the leading coefficient. So here I wrote it as one, but it's not always one. It's one or minus one, depending on whether or not the matrix is even or odd dimensional. So we saw that in a two by two case, it's one, positive. And in a one by one case, it would be just a11 minus lambda, so it would be minus lambda negative. And in the three by three case, it would be minus lambda cubed, so negative again. So it's actually true, it's plus or minus, and it's plus if the power is even, and minus if the power is odd. Sometimes to avoid this plus or minus, people consider minus this matrix, lambda i minus a, and evaluate its determinant. And then you guarantee that this would always be one. And of course, as far as this polynomial is concerned, in other words, this determinant, all we're interested in is its zeros. So it doesn't really matter whether we consider this matrix or minus that matrix. The roots will be the same. Okay, so we made this choice originally, so let's stick with it. So this will be plus or minus. We're done with one term. Let's move on to the next term. And in this term, we'll realize will rely not only on what we know about determinants, but also some elementary algebra that I'll refer to, and I assume that you know it. And if you're vague on what I'm talking about, you'll have to review that, but I won't dedicate any time to those topics in this case, in this video. So what you need to know 
is how to multiply out multiple products, A plus B times C plus D plus E plus F and so forth. So how do you multiply, according to the distributive law, products like that, that have more than two terms in them? Okay, so focusing on lambda to the n minus 1, where would all of these terms come from? Well, there's one product in the determinant, which is the product of the diagonal entries. There are, of course, n factorial minus 1 other terms, but it's this one term that gives us both the leading coefficient and actually the next coefficient. Now, why does it give us the next coefficient? Well, because the next coefficient has to do with lambda to the n minus 1. So we would have to have at least n to the minus 1 lambdas in that product. And all of the lambdas come from the diagonal. So if we're going to have lambda to the n minus 1, it must come from a product that involves at least n minus 1 of these diagonal terms. But you know that in the determinant of a matrix, each of the n factorial terms consists of a product of n entries of the matrix, where all the entries come one from each row, one from each column. So if we're using n minus 1 of these diagonal entries, which means we've already used up n minus 1 rows and n minus 1 columns, the only remaining possibility for that nth entry in the product is the remaining diagonal term. So that's the only way to get lambda to the n, and that's also the only term from which all of the lambda to the n minus 1 come from. And it's this term, it kind of looks like this, a11 minus lambda times a22 minus lambda, and finally a sub n, n minus lambda. All right. So when you multiply it something like this, now I'm referring back to elementary algebra, that's up to you to review. But there will be n terms when you multiply all of these out. There will be n terms that will have lambda to the n minus 1. And whether it's plus or minus will depend on the pow on whether n is even or odd. We'll clarify exactly what happens to the sign. But those terms will be a11, and then another one will be a22, and another one will multiply a33, and another one multiply a sub n n. So when you combine all of them, what you'll have in parentheses, and as I'm writing, I'm reminding you that it's up to you to review why it's these terms, plus a sub n n. When you combine all of them, you'll find the trace, exactly the trace in parentheses. Now, will it be plus or minus? Well, that depends on n. If n is even, and because we're only using n minus 1 of minus lambdas, that power would actually be negative. It'll be minus 1 to an odd power, so negative, not the number. The coefficient will be negative. And otherwise, it will be positive. So whenever there is plus lambda to the n, we'll have minus. And when it's minus lambda to the n, we'll have plus. So when n is even, this is plus and this is minus. When n is odd, this is minus and this is plus. So that's what the second coefficient is. We're done with that second coefficient. And notice that our discussion so far has nothing to do with the eigenvalues. It just has to do with how the coefficients of this polynomial depend on the entries of the matrix. Once we're done with that discussion, eigenvalues, which are the roots of this polynomial, will enter the discussion. Let's talk about the free term. Now, the free term is extraordinarily complicated. It gets contributions not just from this term, but actually from n factorial minus 1 other terms. It gets a little bit of a contribution from each single term. So what will it be? Actually, it'll be n factorial terms that contribute to this free coefficient. So maybe you can see that it, maybe it's the determinant because it's the same n factorial number of terms. But here's a very easy way to see why it's precisely the determinant. And that is, what is the characteristic polynomial evaluated at lambda equals 0? Well, just plug in 0 here. You're left with the determinant of a. So p of 0 equals the determinant of a. But p of 0 is written out right here. Now plug in 0 into this expression. We did it here, got the determinant of a. Now we're doing the same thing here. And of course, the only surviving term is c. Everything else, you're plugging zero. Of course, everything else goes away. 
you just have the free term c, the free coefficient. So it must equal the determinant. So there you go. In the entire characteristic polynomial, we were actually able to determine three coefficients exactly. <clears throat> and they are the ones we're most interested in. So, to summarize, in the characteristic polynomial, we haven't talked about eigenvalues yet, the leading coefficient is plus or minus 1, plus if n is even, odd is otherwise. The second coefficient is minus plus, just to be consistent, the trace, minus when n is even, plus when n is odd, and the free coefficient is the determinant. So those coefficients are always that. Now let's bring in the discussion of the eigenvalues, and once again let's rely on something that you know from elementary algebra. And what you know is that if you have a polynomial with given roots, and there are as many roots as the order of the polynomial, then it must be written, it can always be written in form like this, is these elementary products. After all, plug in lambda equals 2, this won't be 0, or everything won't be 0, except, of course, this term will be 0, so the whole product is 0. So that's a glimpse of why that's true, but it's something that you know from elementary algebra, with one caveat that there might also be a leading coefficient. But, of course, if we want to match this coefficient of plus or minus 1 times lambda to the n, this one right here has to be 1, so we actually don't have to write it at all. So there are two ways to write the characteristic polynomial. This one, which is always true no matter what, and this one, assuming that we have n eigenvalues. Okay, so that's where we lose a little bit of generality, ignoring the complex case, which can also be treated this way, and not really ignoring some of the more subtle cases, but those more subtle cases require some careful way of thinking here. But in any case, here is the alternative way of writing the characteristic polynomial. But once you have this way of writing the characteristic polynomial, once again, multiply it out. The leading coefficient will be exactly this. The, let's maybe talk about the free coefficient next. The free coefficient will result when you choose this constant number from each of the set of parentheses, from each of the sets of parentheses, and of course the free term will be the product of the lambdas. That's true for all polynomials that have n roots. The product of the roots equals the free, the free coefficient. But we just discovered that the free coefficient is the determinant of the matrix. So the product of the roots, sort of a wonderful moment, equals the product of the eigenvalues because the roots are the eigenvalues, and that equals the determinant. So we've captured one magical property, actually number two of the eigenvalues. So we're done with that one. But what's the coefficient corresponding to lambda to the n minus 1? Well, by the same token, once all of this is multiplied out, there will be n terms contributing to lambda to the n minus 1. You can think through the sign. It will be exactly minus or plus, depending on the parity of the power, whether n is even or odd. And, of course, what we'll find in parentheses is lambda 1 plus lambda 2 plus lambda n, just like here, by the same argument, it was a11 plus a sub n n, and everything in between. And, of, of course, that coefficient will match this coefficient, because it's true for all polynomials. Their product is the free coefficient, but their sum of the zeros is minus or plus the second to leading coefficient. And so, the sum of the eigenvalues, which is that second and second coefficient, will match this coefficient with the proper minus or plus, plus matching in both cases, which equals the trace. And there you have it. The sum of the eigenvalues equals the trace, and the product of the eigenvalues equals the determinant. And this is a very neat and simple algebraic argument that shows us that those hold at all times. Or at least, under a very general set of circumstances. That, of course, doesn't detract from this argument, which is simple, beautiful, and purely algebraic.